Lover, Not Yet Lover, a prose poem of two extraordinary loves, hope being eternal, loss controlling the future. And so it was, plain and simple, a necessary thing to do, an oath moving in one's self at the beginning of resolve, a slow upward presence, a climbing of spirits, so that he saw it coming as if from a field of mist caught out atop the grass, morning young and dew-spread and spent under the sun exerting itself anew, and with it all he saw the outcome, how it would come down this line swift as a memory in some far place where he was out of the habit range. This wide place he might have called home grounds, except it was not solicitous at the time, and that memory, as stark as it might be at the finish of its appearance, would come like that same mist off the grass, at first as conceivable, then as probable, and finally with a sense of thanksgiving come whole and moving, and it would be her and her final presence in the same place, in his heart and not his mind, in his heart and not behind his eyes where he thought he'd see it again and again, in his heart and not in his hands the way she'd come back at odd moments of the night with a twist and a turn and a sigh. But sleep now a dread enemy, sleep an impossibility, sleep that came of wretched evasion and long mourning, and just as always she'd be visible in a new haven, looking at him, her chin in hand, blue eyes as wide as ever, sending him that continual message, only to have it waylaid by someone other than either one of them, another body in her place, a new touch, a new taste, a woman of thought, a woman possible, perhaps around the corner, perhaps at the next a cup of tea, perhaps a pair of eyes he'd know would be her eyes in a second place of her coming, and he'd roll over and hate himself and cry his poor soul to sleep. Where it all began and might end had come upon him as surprise comes to any alert soul. Her illness and unaccustomed to turn, a brevity of concern at first, a slight indication of some small piece not working, the way it happens in ordinary door chimes, the least of importance, for the knock would follow and the entrance conducted and the gaiety loosed once more or then more thorny as in a clock or a spring might be caught unawares or a notch filled with debris or a gear snagged and time by the minute would go its way or an hour to the end of the month where some do would get undone, unfinished, lost. He didn't know his loss more than separation, more than death. She had the last word saved up for a delivery meticulous and persuasive. Do not stop what you are doing. Do not chase after me in any hurry. And in all loyalty and bound by this promise, find someone to talk to, to read to, to release to. It was command, it was order, it was stand to. He brought himself back to a new day where it would begin for him, coming that ordinary way in a soft hour of evening as the sun tipped its hat goodnight at the kitchen window, and across the room in a friend's house he could see her acknowledging again one of her last days in that special way she had of salutation reminding him how everybody in God's 
had her, loved her, the patients whose cries she could hug, the nurse orderlies that she trumpeted to all and sundry, how they had come from devastation and nothing to hope for, unto this place of hope, agreeing with her that all should be pain-free and exalted in their dignity, even as all those days dwindled into sobs few heard but her at the door of the room, at the end of the hall, with the last step from the inside of that huge elderly home to the outside the evening blessing her tired moves, her muscles, her spirit looking for nourishment for the day to follow, for surely repetition was the sin there. He knew how it would happen. It began for him across a room in that friend's house where people mixed in merriment and talk of another loss in celebration, the babble and groundswell moving in slight waves, keeping all corners alive, not with the same words, but with the same intents. The look, the approach, the manner, the ascent without a sound, agreement working the fields of the bodies in the large room, in the field of his body, that new pair of eyes saying all the things he might want to hear, putting aside judgments and comparisons, putting aside the cause of the initial attraction, because her eyes were running with the words he could not hear but understood, the way semaphore flags at the lip of an aircraft carrier can spell its position and its acceptance to a pilot winging his way home, out of gas, praying for the lap of safety, the parts all together for maybe the last time in this life. Later, the stub of afternoon coming spent, the one with the announcing eyes would point out the window to three children of the neighborhood playing in a side lawn of a neat house whose red bricks had taken on a dusky red hue the sun has some days in late summer, whose hedges were trimmed by a barber with comb and scissors and whose windows must have been dressed by a quaint old lady caught up in a peering of colors. This mere stranger for the moment, who had come from across the room at the beginning of her place in all of this, with her own loss, stared at the children, a light falling across her face, across the lenses of her eyes, in the way those children ought to be seen in a choice part of the inner eye, a roll call brought to bear with their histories coming on, the schools of their grown years assembled a piecemeal in the new fiction as though they were now promised, or had been promised long before these new parents had come on the scene to make their wishes, to say their prayers, to offer their thanksgivings. Her voice had a mysterious quality in it. Let's make them ours. She said it with soft passion, with an eye on their clocks, and with solemn promise, as if it had already happened, that mini adoption, that quick attachment. Let's watch them whenever we can, as, as obliged we would be, Enjoy their goodness ahead, their coming small sadness. See them leap up and onward and hold them dear as we might, as we ought in the silence of our hearts, as if they are ours. That is the most of love I can muster. The words that followed might have been spoken before by her of the past. Let's be in love again, each of us with all possibilities for as long as we can. She took his hand and held it close 
and in another moment he knew he should move his hand upon the promise. The knights would say their names, and it would be enough to hear the soft syllables. And so the way it was supposed to happen, it did. Love advancing the soul's inner light, the massive of coming at once, at first an illusion so beautiful had, it had been unimagined, and then after his wanton sleep was beset and circulated with toss and turn, and with a side glance at once leaving a mark in his memory, she moved from the cubby of her own shadow into the scan of his horizon and remained in that one spot that totally owned space by herself, a grace emanating from that aura unseen as music, but the tempo and the unbidden language coming along with it, the rhythm of a woman who moves with ease into the depth of a man where she assimilates, absorbs, animates by motion so subtle to this day they still overpower him. She moved like the appreciation of a mountain morning hovering over a lake, a mist of slow and ascension to translate into an unseen level, allowing iridescence of innumerable growths to appear in a painting his eyes said existed solely for his vision. At the moment, no other person seeing what he was seeing, and in its climbing into a nothing that did exist for his wonder and awe became the other side of the lake, she in one image he had put away for all time as that one image to salvage him from despair and loss so unequivocal it promised no future to his natural hunger and need. Knowing from the inception she was a dream come alive for him, this woman a mere mist at first, coming alive, a smile wide as horizon coming alive, a voice saying she was real coming alive, its tone so meticulous and full of clarity, it struck him with lightning delivery, the first word coming alive his name, the very first sound saying she was thinking of him and beset with the energies and want that had littered his days and nights, steady as cast off memories, shunting aside but never letting go, the other truths hanging on, past dear life. His name came slowly in the night, in the truth of darkness, on the breath of a woman coming the way only a woman moves, a languorous length of her, a gloried broadness, a hip salutation as much signature as identification into his mind before all, all else, into the spirit sitting there alone and waiting for the word, the gesture, the hand sending its touch on a linen full of sound but so silken and smooth. It was as if his name came carried there first, the manner of the passage as much invitation as any invitation might be broadcast from soul to soul. The call heard and the reply sent outward, the elegant length of a reduced, brought closer, a loop in its coming, a grasp, a homing brought to bear his all, an ascension of his will silent at first, but then pounding in his heart, and then to his mind where it evolved as the transfer of love more monumental, yet existing in that languorous depth beneath him and a grip only her kind owned. He said her name, and it rose, pious and devout, though of a second nature, an element about in the night like an unseen feather on unseen air, but letting off a whisper of sound, a whisper of such prom promise and continuity it came of soul salvage, of mere dreaming, of harnessed energy, of the ultimate connection of essence and turmoil mixing the grander ingredients where imagination alone is the king, the guidepost, the whip soft as bee flight, as positive, her grasp 
essential. Then, in brevity of concern, of conscience, he heard a voice.